Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast, a place where we focus on the business side of art to help you attract more customers, increase profits, and ultimately live a life of creativity and financial freedom. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and this week's episode features Missouri-based artist and sculptor Susan Sommer. This was a big interview for me because I've been hoping to connect with Susan for years. She's a big-time artist in my area, like not just big on Instagram like me, but big in real life. She charges $50,000 plus for her original paintings. She has several popular murals in my city of Springfield, and her well-established name has earned her the opportunity to be the featured artist for sports events like the Kentucky Derby and the Olympics. I told you she's a really big deal. So listen to hear how Susan got her start as an artist with a lot of hard work and no professional training. You know, I ask about pricing and tips on how to open doors of opportunity as a working artist. So listen to hear her unique answers and perspective on an evolving art slash sculpture slash mural industry. And let me know what you think about this week's episode with Susan Summer. Hey there, we are live with Susan. And I'm so excited, as I was saying, to connect with you finally. I've been hearing your name for years and years. <laughs> and because <laughs> if anybody doesn't know, Susan is a big time artist, especially in my area. So she's not just cool on Instagram like I am. <laughs> she's actually like real life cool and I've been wanting to meet her for a very long time. So not to fangirl too much, but can you please give us a little bit of a just kind of backstory about how you got started, who you are and like the Olympics and all the stuff? (laughs) Well, if you want to go way back, I think my childhood is a big part of it. And I was born on a dairy farm (laughs) in a town called Arno, Missouri, just west southwest of Ava, population three. And that's where I started. We eventually moved to Billings, Missouri. And that's before I started school or anything. And I grew up on a horse farm with cattle. We raised dogs. We had, we had a pretty big horse farm. It was, we'd have 50 horses at a time. It was a major part of our business. So I grew up on the farm adoring horses and eventually was training horses and drawing horses and um, everything else, anything else. But my parents were a big part of my whole start to this life that I have because I was constantly drawing. I have four brothers. We were big into sports and big into horses. And I was the only one that was left-handed and an artist. I mean, left-handed in family history. There was nobody else. (laughs) My mother, to go even farther back, my mother was a really awesome artist. She actually had scholarships to go to Mexico City, Mexico. That My mother and father were from Wisconsin, and my mother had scholarships in art. My father was a horse trainer. They got together and got married and moved to Arkansas first, but my mom chose that path, and she never pursued her art career. So she never went to art school or anything, but she was an amazing artist and she had paintings all over the house. And one painting in particular, of course, was of a horse. And I always wanted to paint like that. (laughs) I started drawing the horses on the farm. And here's the interesting part. My parents never like, I couldn't draw something and they'd be like, oh, that's so great and wonderful. And then hang it on the refrigerator or whatever people do. It was... Well, that could be different. That you need to change that. You need to correct that. They provided me with the tools and everything I needed and always encouraged me to do better. And it was a long time before I was able to pick a horse out of all the horses we had, draw that horse to the point where my father had nothing to pick on. And I was probably about 11 or 12 years old. And when that happened, He said, well, that's pretty good. And then he said, now do that with your right hand. (laughs) What? Yeah, do it with your right hand. So I spent years drawing with my right hand when I was a kid until I could perfect a horse to that standard where my dad would say, well, that's great, you know, or that's good. Now, you know, you've done something. So 
with that said, I'm ambidextrous and I paint with both hands. I was kind of like with all my brothers and being in sports and everything, I learned from my brothers and I learned from them and I was always right-handed in sports. And this was like, it's kind of confusing, but I, I eventually realized I was drawing and painting with both hands and I didn't even realize it. I had people pointed out to me, oh, you just switched hands. <laughs> that was a big deal, but I never took art classes. And I never went to art school. While I was in school, I loved writing. And I wrote, I was in a lot of contests and won contests. I ended, eventually ended up winning a scholarship. And I went to college for journalism and creative writing. <laughs> so the art was always there, though. I was always doing it and showing it and just loved it. And But, you know, back then, it's like you can't pursue that because of the starving artist whole thing. So I never thought that I could be an artist in that sense. And I really worked at that. And then while I was in college, I got an internship with Lytton Industries. And when I was there, they put me in a position where I was on the job training in uh, graphic arts for circuitry. So I learned how to design circuit boards. And that back then I thought was my future. I was good at it. I actually moved into another position at Solid State and I started designing circuitry for the Gulf War a long time ago. <laughs> One of my boards is still being used in the Patriot missile. I loved it. I got all that training in my graphics and learning computers because we didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, I mean, it was a lot different back then. There wasn't social media, websites, all that stuff. So I used that later to my advantage because I knew computers. I knew I loved designing. I designed after that, I was designing logos and stuff like that for many businesses. But anyway, that's how I started out. But my, I was always doing stuff. And as far as art goes, creating things. I just love to create and paint and uh, draw. So basically, it's just been a lot of uh, moments in time, a lot of good luck, just meeting the right people, people asking me to do things, creating things, them spreading the word. I mean, it's just been, it was my story. It was a, probably a lot different than a lot of your listeners. I mean, I'm sure it's different, <laughs> but I really just couldn't get it out of my heart. And as soon as I could get enough art business going, I didn't do anything else. And when times were good, it was great. When times, you know, you got your up, ups and downs, especially in the beginning, you just really have to make sacrifices and be uh, dedicated and really determined yeah. to make art world. How did you get your first couple commissions? And so, and for anybody who doesn't know, so like if you walk into our local piano bar, you'll see Susan's work. And if you walk around the corner, you'll see Susan's work. Like it's kind of everywhere. So you're a local mural. Do you still do murals here? I kind of limit the murals to about one or two a year now. I'm really busy doing private commissions and other things. But as far as my first commission... I was pretty young and my father took one of my pieces of art to somebody he knew and sold it. And I couldn't believe it because the other thing you don't know is how bashful I was. I, I wouldn't even show people my art. I was always hiding it, doing it in private, pretty bashful kid. So he sold my first piece. And then after that, you know, I knew that there was value there. So I think how you get going is knowing you have value and if you have it and then uh, continuing with that and charging for it. You can't give your art away. You just can't. Yeah. And it sounds like you really took the time to get good at what you're, what you were doing too, which I think is a major pillar that a lot of artists maybe are like, ah, I'll just kind of, I'll try to sell while I'm getting good and getting, you know, your, your, your art established. But 
you, it sounds like you, you really spent a lot of time to where you had a really good product and you could stand behind it. And I totally understand how being bashful and all the, like, I was a very shy kid as well. And I think the majority of our listeners are like, don't look at my stuff. <laughs> so we totally yeah. get it. <laughs> but yeah. So then, okay. So your dad helped. That's props to your dad and, and your mom, really, for the Hi. inherent skill. Also, you worked for Bass Pro Shops, too. Oh, yeah. When they first started their nationwide expansion. How did you get connected with that? I was their premier artist for a long time. They sent me around the country when they were popping up stores everywhere right back then in the beginning. How did I get that? Probably just being in the right place at the right time. They came to me. And uh, they, you know, I, I had done enough at that point that I was kind of getting known, you know, here locally. Of course, the headquarters are here. And I had one of their people come and find me. And um, I got that job. And I literally spent all my time working for Bass Pro for quite a while. And there was no other time for anything else. And um, I really had that drive that I wanted to do other things in art and that's you know when I I kind of geared myself towards doing other things too but it was a great it was a great experience it was great learning experience I I learned a lot and I did so much I mean I would be I would be sent to a store three days before they open and have to do like a huge mural with turkeys or bears and trees and whatever like that could be anywhere from two stories to three stories high and get it done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I am like laughing because I'm like, I know exactly how like, so yeah. I, I also got my start and I know exactly what you're talking about, about having nothing else and to like, cause they keep you so busy and working on the road is tough and, yeah. but, it's a, but it's a great learning experience. So I'm just laughing. I'm like, yes, that's exactly. They're like, okay. sorry. Yeah, what? they had this. I think it was in Colorado, but it was a three story tall elevator shaft that was surrounded by trees and it went all the way down and everything. But the elevator shaft was just this gray blob like the elevator would go up and down. It was exposed with windows. But when the elevator, you know, the background of the elevator was it was just it kind of broke up the whole scene. So they were trying to find the person that would do that elevator shaft which required standing on top of an elevator an elevator that was like a small elevator the top platform I might have had three or four square feet I mean three by four feet so like 12 square feet and then the there was a guy that sat behind me so I obviously took the job I was the only one that would do it there was a guy that sat on a box and had his controls all night long. We had to do it at night so that they didn't need, you know, have to use the elevator. Started at the very top and I worked all night long and painted this to blend in with the whole surrounding. And I couldn't leave that area. And I could, I mean, it was like probably the most crazy, one of the most crazy things I've done. <laughs> There was no boundary around. There was no railing or anything. I was on top of the elevator. That was one of the things that, you know, I just went, I just reached out. I just did it. I wasn't afraid. I'm not afraid of heights. I'm not afraid of a lot of things. That was a crazy experience. But I just, one of those things that I think back on and I think, well, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> but I don't really focus on doing work that is, I would consider blending or faux finishes or stuff like that. But that was a challenge for me because nobody wanted to do it. I'm used to working all night long. I don't require a lot of sleep. <laughs> I like working at night because people don't bother you or call you or anything. I'm, I'm very focused in my work when I'm working. So yeah, that was one of the crazy experiences, but that's crazy. Yeah. I feel like that's one of those where OSHA would have had a field day, but it's like, if nothing <laughs> happened, we're fine. Well, you're so young too. And I, there were things, I mean, way back then you wouldn't believe you certainly couldn't be afraid. I'm talking about a lot of projects. I had a lot of projects where I was just kind of same way. I learned how to swim, just thrown out in the pool. I was just thrown out in the water and did it. And yeah. That determination that kept me going and that was always, it always impressed people, 
you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. How did, so how did you go from Bass Pro to being a featured artist for the Olympics? Well, like I said, it's moments in time. Good luck. Destiny. (laughs) I'm primarily known as a sports artist. And like I said, I grew up with, you know, just always involved in sports, whether it be horse racing or basketball was my big sport when I was young and, you know, having all my brothers and everything. I was always like doing stuff. And as when things happened, sometimes people would notice that, oh, wow, well, she does this or she does that because I didn't just do uh, horse racing. So when I was involved in horse racing and doing all that high profile stuff, other sports entities noticed me and contacted me. It was just, things came to me. Okay. So I guess just breaking into the industry of the Kentucky Derby is another Mm -hmm. one, right? And so which one was your first one that you got? It Was it a referral from someone that was like, hey, could you be our Kentucky Derby artist? And then it just kind of went up from there or? Well, that's a good question. This is why my story can never be repeated because, and I don't think anybody's can, but it's like, there was a time I was getting really well known back then and doing all kinds of stuff, ocean murals for flora, you know, whatever. And people that knew me, it was like kind of like word of mouth. As far as the Kentucky Derby, Barbaro had died the year before. He was the big hope for the Triple Crown. And, you know, at that point, we still hadn't had a Triple Crown winner. It took like 30 some odd years to get American Pharaoh. And there was this big dream and he was so talented and he got hurt in the Preakness, which ended his career. And then, but he had won the Kentucky Derby the year before. So the Kentucky Derby contacted me and I, you know, I was well known as a horse artist my whole life. (laughs) And they contacted me and then asked me to do art for them for the following year. And this was going to soften the blood. I mean, people were hurting and sad. Just like all sports, horses get hurt too. They're athletes. I mean, everybody gets hurt. All sports, you hear all the stuff about concussions and football and everything else. But it's a tough sport. And so they asked me to come there and I did art for them. I, you know, I was out there. They asked me to be in the uh, paddock. And then actually I was on ESPN at 5 a.m. national. And uh, it was, it just happened to be the day that the queen was going to be there. So it was a big day and there was a lot of security, tons of security. So I get there in the morning and I'm on ESPN national doing this interview and then they say, I can't leave. Like once you're in that day, you can't leave. It's all that it was so secure. And so I was in these heels <laughs> and everything. And then I knew I had to paint live and, and do all this stuff. And I ended up painting 10 feet from her all day. She was like behind. Whoa. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I had, I don't even know how many countless, I was on the set of ESPN all day and countless, uh, stars coming by and talking to me and it was just like it was amazing and I remember that day Andrea I remember that day (laughs) when it was all done I thought well this is it there's never going to be anything better than this I really you know that's this is it but then it just it was it just kept coming it still keeps coming it's just been I've been very lucky and very fortunate to be in the position I am That's amazing. What an amazing networking opportunity that you just kind of fell into there. But, but it it comes because you were prepared, you know, like, yeah, yes, luck a little bit, but like you were prepared for that. And so all, all of those other opportunities that came too, it's because of that preparation that you had done. Yeah. And I think I always credit my parents and they've never seen that. My father passed away before that. My mom had Alzheimer's and then she passed away. They both passed away from cancer, actually. But it's like they never got to see all that. But I can't even imagine. And I'm starting to get choked. up. <laughs> but I can't even imagine how proud they would be. So I always think they're they're actually with me. And they're the ones that have made all this happen. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's 
Yeah. And I'm, I know they'd be so proud. Wow. That's so, so my, my grandmother gave me my inherit skill and then she also passed right before I did anything. And so I've, that's so funny because I've always thought that in the back of my head, I'm like, I feel like it's my grandmother just kind of like giving me little bits of luck, but yeah. I've, I've never heard anybody else say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I even hear their voices sometimes because oh. my mom, even when she had Alzheimer's and I had my galleries downtown and I would take her, she lived with me after my father passed away and I took care of her for many years and my father actually before that, but she would just sit behind me and watch me paint and everything. And then she would be like, yeah, that's it. That's it. So I would do something. She'd be like, that's it. That's it. And then I'd say, well, come up here and paint with me. It's probably the only person I've ever painted with in my life. And I, I'm pretty sure it's, it is, is my mom. And um, she just loved it. But that didn't last very long because she was, yeah, like I said, she had Alzheimer's. And, but it meant the world to me. And I, I got her painting, you know, she did that for therapy. And then I started the therapy program here. She just loved it. And I can't imagine you know, having them here, they shouldn't be, they should be here. <laughs> that should have never happened. They were very cheated, cheated not to see their, well, the whole family. I mean, you know, the kids, the grandkids and all that stuff, but of all my brothers and just missed out on a lot. But like I said, and like you too, I think they're with us and I think they encourage us and keep us going. And I think they're, they're the ones that bring us a, that luck. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. Man, I did not know that. That's wild. I know that they would be so proud and I'm sure they are. They oh. now. And yeah. Okay. So we actually met the other night because you came into this Mexican restaurant that I, we were eating at and somebody said, that's Susan. And I popped right up and I was like, hi, I'm Adrian. I was like, can I interview you? And what we were talking and I was talking to the owner's daughter and she was like, yeah, this painting right here is one of the one that Susan did. And we paid her $50,000 for it. And I was like, whoa, that's so awesome. So can we talk about how you got to the point of charging 50 grand for a painting and like how, like, can you talk about your pricing strategies a little bit? We love to talk about money and that's, that number is so impressive to a lot of us. Nobody can tell you how to price your work. It all falls on demand. So a person can only do so much. And the more in demand I am, the more the prices go up. But I'll tell you one thing. Don't ever do anything for free. You won't have a car dealership giving away cars for exposure. Just think about that. It doesn't do them any good, especially in art. It doesn't do you any good. And it doesn't do the art market any good. Artists need to charge for their art. It's work. But the more in demand you are, the more selective you can be and the higher your price goes. And it's, you know, I'm constantly working. I I can't even tell you when I last had a vacation. Uh, like that was just going somewhere that didn't involve work in some way. <laughs> so my time, I feel is valuable. I think you have to determine what your, your time is worth. Your art is only worth what people will pay for it. And you have to stick with it and never go back. Once you reach a price, don't go back. Stay with that price. Give up job. Learn to say no. And the other thing is, don't ever do stuff that you don't really like unless you absolutely have to. But if you have to, do the knock them out of the park. I mean, just... Do your best and keep going. But if you do things that you don't really love and you're not crazy about, you're going to end up doing a lot of it. And True. free up your time to do the things that you really should be doing. So I've gotten to a point. I'm really, really fortunate that I can pick and choose what I do. And um, But there were many years, <laughs> many years in, of uh, just doing cutting my teeth, you know, doing things that I particularly didn't like to do, but I do them because I wanted, I didn't want to go out and get a, you know, a, a regular job and not have the time to do the big things that were coming. I always believed in myself. So you got to have that kind of attitude, I think, to make it in the art world. It's not the, I think being an artist is probably the hardest thing in the world. 
It is pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, who, who needs an artist? I mean, you don't really need art. You don't have, <laughs> it's like something that people, fortunately, there are a lot of people out there that love art and then they have to love you. And if you do a great job and you always give it all you got, you'll get more of it. And um, when you get those jobs that you really enjoy, that's when you got to really think, I want more of this. So you've got to, you just got to really make it work. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many years did it take you to get to that point? We had, we had a question come in right here. Like, so maybe in the beginning you were charging $1,000 and then it took you a few years to charge 2000 and, or like how, what's kind of the range there? Well, the issue with that question is I never discuss my pricing. That's always confidential with the client. If they want to discuss it, that's up to them. But it's always been private. I stick to increasing my prices, never decreasing, because you don't want that. It's not going to do you any good, and it's not going to make your previous clients very happy if they find out. As far as that goes, I mean, my prices went up really, really fast when I started doing a lot of high profile stuff. And um, because I just, I'm a one man show, a one woman show, I guess. I'm a one woman show. I do everything myself. I'm self taught. My scope of work is, I mean, I do so many different things. And then I just have to figure out what I want to do the most of and try to do more of that. But that's how your prices go up. It's demand. I mean, demand is the big thing in the marketplace. Now, that's all fine art. But if you're talking about murals, murals are basically, to me, they're fun. I'll make some time to do murals. But you can't really charge like you do for fine art if you're in demand. You have to kind of know the market, know what the scale is. It's easy to look up. You just Google it and it changes all the time, just like everything else. And you find where you fall on that scale, if you're low end or high end. And you stick to that because murals are basically paint on a wall. It's not something that is collectible or it's just different than fine art. It is a lot of fun. I love doing it. And that's why I keep doing it. But I'm very selective in, you know, what I do. So as far as pricing goes, yeah, that's the best I can tell you. Because every artist is different. Every artist is like a fingerprint or they should be an artist that finds something unique and really just loves it and they'll do okay you can't try to follow or try to be like or think you know it's got to be your own it's got to be your heart and what you love that makes it all work because it's art and it's subjective and you can't get your feelings hurt and no matter what you do not everybody's gonna love what you do you're you can't please everybody and um, and so you got to be tough. I think being an artist is probably you got to have really thick skin, be tough, be willing to sacrifice, determined, and have luck on your side. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice storm of all the all the things. Okay, so <laughs> price via demand. That's that's a that's good advice. Um, you uh, really quick before we get off here. You also do sculpture. Can you touch on that? You say sculpture of horses, or is it iron? I do all kinds of sculpture. There's so many different kinds that I do, but I've always been a sculptor. I've always been a builder. I've always like I was in me- auto mechanics. I took auto mechanics in college. I've always been interested on in the makings of something and sculpture is all, all about the form. I've always been a sculptor and been a commissioned sculptor since I was in my 20s. It's a whole different thing. Another thing about me is I'm kind of ADD. <laughs> not kind of, I know I am. I'm not diagnosed, but it's like I don't want to do one thing. And in art, it's kind of difficult because most artists focus on one style or one subject. And that's typically, but for me personally, and I'm different, I've not been taught. I just delve into different things, but I always like leave the most time for the things that I really, really think are what I enjoy. And that's how I've kind of molded myself into the position I'm at doing that stuff. I don't have to do the stuff I don't want to do. 
I love doing sculpture. Sculpture is very difficult. It takes a lot of time. There's many different ways. If I tried to teach you, forget it, because I would only confuse you. I'm self-taught, and I'm not an art teacher. But if you have that talent, it's a whole different world to me to use, to have that ability to do a three-dimensional as opposed to a flat painting. But it, I love doing both. And I've actually been told I'm a sculptor longer than I have been told I'm a painter. I've been a sculptor my whole life. I've always been making things. What's in your studio right now? Like, what, what are you excited to be working on? I got secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little secret. I got several secret. Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm very private. But I have clients come to my studio to see their art, stuff like that when it's complete or almost complete or whatever. But right now I've got a really cool painting that is going to go out tomorrow. They're coming tomorrow. I've got a couple sculptures I'm doing that are going to be long-term, I mean, work. It's going to take months, literally, to get those done. But I don't really say what it is because I keep it kind of like secret. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're, well, you're not you're not much on I, yeah you know, social media or anything like that. You just I mean, which is which is great that you don't have to do that. But yeah, just you're just you have the the dream life. You to work in your studio all day. I do, I do. I seriously, I wouldn't want it any other way. I don't know how I got here, <laughs> except for <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. And if if I could tell you everything, it'd probably blow your mind. All the stuff that I've had to do to get here. But my dad would always say, he would always say, well, it's talent. (laughs) And I always said, no, I don't think it's talent. I think it's how hard you want it or how determined you are. He said, no, it's talent. And, um, you know, you can have talent. I really think there's millions of talented artists out there, millions. But how many people have that determination and they can stick to it and they can make the sacrifices? That takes it's a whole different thing. You got to really work at it. Yeah, I, I totally agree that there, there's a lot of things that I've gotten to where just because I was like raising my hand, like me, pick me right now and I will show up early and I will work harder. And like, it was, yeah, I think it's both. There's so many talented people, but there's only that few that really have Want that. it bad enough. Yep. Yeah. And they stick with it because you're going to get your feelings hurt. I'm sure you've had your feelings hurt. Yeah. Your feelings hurt. You can't please everybody. There's going to be, you know, those times. And then you just got to let it roll off and keep going. Because if you believe in yourself, that's all that matters. And if you can make a living, that's really good. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. Well, well, this is a great spot to end at. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat. And again, I'm so glad we got to connect. Me too. And that's a wrap. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Artist Academy podcast. And if you like hearing interviews just like this in your ear, if they inspire you, then I want to encourage you to go download the audible version of my new book, mural money it's a condensed version of basically all the best of the best tips given here on the podcast from guests plus my own words of wisdom to help you get started in any art industry plus stories of some hard lessons learned that i have never told before you can pick up a copy at muralmoney.com and again i highly recommend the audible version i put a lot of tender love and care to make sure the audible was extra special and had some extra goodness in there and It's really for any artist, but especially those wanting to make a profit from a paintbrush. Muralmoney.com, that's it. I'll see you next week.